So Nehemiah, we are in chapter 5 tonight, and you guys might remember last week in chapter 4, it was a really victorious week because um, all the different groups from the Samaritans and the Arabs and and uh, some groups of the Jews with Tobiah and Sambalat, they all got together in a big war party and they were planning on attacking Israel and, and they got the, the, you know, the fear factor out there big time, you know, uh, telling them they're going to kill them anytime. They won't even know they, you know, were behind them until their throats slit. And, and, uh, and, and Israel did not stop. They did not stop building the wall down to the point where they had a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. And they stationed soldiers and they stationed bugle blowers and they had a plan if they got attacked they where they would all rally and how they would fight in the battle they never had to. But even in the difficulty of this extreme threat, they continued hauling up those burnt stones and they continued building the wall, which had to be much harder because they were already past halfway up. So the taller it gets, the more delicate the work becomes, the more difficult it becomes. But tonight we are going to see that there is an inside enemy, inside issues. And the inside issues do stop the work. Scary. So we're here in chapter 5, verse 1, and there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. So the wives in particular really bit into a group of the elite Jews. We're going to discover it was most likely the same elite group that wouldn't do their part of the building. Remember the elite group of the Jews, the Toachites, the Rulers wouldn't put their shoulder to the work, but instead they had energy to make money off the poor people who were doing the work. And um, so it's interesting that the enemy from the outside couldn't stop the work, but the enemy or people behaving badly, carnally from the inside do stop the work. Well, in verse 2 through 5, and there were those who said, we, our sons, our daughters, are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. There were also some who said, we have mortgaged our lands, our vineyards, our houses, that we might buy grain because of the famine. And there were also those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our lands and our vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as flesh of our brethren, our children and their children. Indeed, we are forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and our vineyards. So the, the money problem was not a problem like you usually see in a building project. It's usually they don't have money to, for the materials to build the building. You know, so they're saying, hey, we need 300000 for concrete, so kick in and we'll, buy, we'll do the concrete. No, now we don't have money for building the, the, the walls. We need money for the wood or whatever. That's not the case here because all that was donated by Xerxes. Remember, Nehemiah got all the materials he needed and all the money and papers and soldiers. And it, 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 the, the whole project was already funded uh, by the king. But the problem was great, much more severe. It was literally the people building the wall were living hand to mouth. A day's work was pretty much being spent on food for the day. So what little money they had saved up, they had already spent in the 20, 30 days they had been building. And they didn't have any money for the food. That's it. It was just for food. And so these rich guys who weren't putting their shoulders to the work began to realize, wow, I could accumulate a lot of extra land and I could accumulate a lot of extra money off these people by putting them in servitude to me by loaning them money at an interest. 
And they did that, and we're going to discover in in verse 11, it was at a 12% interest. But quickly, they didn't have money to make the mortgage payment to keep the land. So they were quickly becoming homeless. And then they're saying, hey, you you have kids, so we're going to go to the law. And the judges, who were also the ones in on this whole scheme, said, oh, yeah, you got to give your kids to them to be slaves to make your mortgage, your monthly mortgage payment. And so it wasn't enough. They didn't have money to feed their kids. Now their kids are being taken away in in slavery. Uh, And so um, it's it's amazing that the people hadn't complained sooner. They were literally working without eating. They were literally building this wall so sacrificially They didn't even have money to pay for food to feed their kids. They were so sacrificially building, they were mortgaging their futures, their land, whatever they possessed, just to get enough food to keep building the wall. That's serious dedication. I grew up in a denomination, a Methodist denomination, and I know the old pastors told me that when they were the, 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 their movement at the time was a, a moving across the country that they often would be praying, God, give us a building. What would you have us do? And one pastor said several times this happened where the Lord just spoke to the whole congregation to tithe 90% and to trust him and only take 10% to live on. And I'm like, how is that possible? He goes, it's not possible. But yet, God put that on our hearts, everybody. And within a few months, sometimes close to a year, the entire building was built and paid for. But during that season, we often got together and did the building at nights and people would bring food and we would share food and eat dinners and, and we'd build and, and pray and worship and have a Bible study and build and pray. And it literally went on almost every day of the week. We were there all every weekend. And it was the most wonderful time in our life. And uh, he said, I doubt you will ever have a group of people, will ever have a church that are willing to do that in the way the culture is today. And the way the economy is today, it's a little different, but... I was like, wow, that, that would have been something to be a part of that. Well, I, I think this would have been really something to be a part of this. To realize that when these people said yes to this building project, they probably knew in the back of their minds this was going to cost them dearly. I don't think Nehemiah, not understanding the culture coming in from living in the palace of Susha, quite understood how tentative and how fragile the economy for these very poor people who lived in Israel, not only near Jerusalem, but away from Jerusalem, uh, were, were living. And so all of a sudden, this situation happened. And uh, I'm just sort of in awe of the dedication uh, of these people. J- just a note, just to let you know, I, I've had... Three different building projects as pastor of Calvary San Diego, but I also helped out with several building projects in other countries. And I can, I can tell you, there is never a good time to build. <laughs> the very first building we built was right in the 2000, was uh, in, in a time where there was a horrible recession that hit, and it hit the space industry. And most of our people worked at Goodrich or Teledyne Ryan, and, and literally, um, I was generally the first building we built. It was um, uh, about uh, 12,000 square feet, and, and I had been a carpenter, and I was generally in it, and, and I was there at five in the morning and didn't go home until the work was done and, you know, but at the same time, I'm in the building of this building project, literally almost everybody in the church loses their job. And and 
I had oh, 100, 200 ladies telling me my husband won't get out of bed because if he can go get a job, it's for a fraction of what he made in the aero business. And there is absolutely no jobs available anyway. It was a really serious recession. And um, so I would get the guys together at a building we were renting at the time, a Seventh-day Adventist church. And I would get the sanctuary filled up with these 100, 200 guys every morning. So they would get out of bed, (laughs) literally, and we would have a prayer meeting and worship and, and, and then, you know, they would go out and look for a job. But it was basically just to get him out of bed. And we did that uh, at 7 o'clock and then 8 o'clock they were out looking for a job. And I had to do that for months and just until the numbers went from 200 to 150 to 100. Until then there was like 10 guys left and then finally everybody had a job. But it was one more thing on top of trying to general this building which was killing me. The next building project we had just, oh, by the way, in that building, we got in the building, our ties literally were not enough money to cover the mortgage payment because everybody lost their job. So we went from having a a sufficient tithe to, you know, convince the bank to loan us the money to the time we got in the building, we didn't even have enough tithe to make the mortgage payment. And, and we were like that for several months. And to see the Lord provide doing miracle after miracle. I mean, literally, on more than one occasion. Um, I had a gal who was just amazing, who came in and volunteered to be the secretary, the bookkeeper, and everything. She was equal to a four-star general who, who ran a military base, but she was an amazing gal. And, but she'd say, okay, uh, it's Thursday, and uh, the electricity and water will be shut off by Saturday if we don't pay this amount. And of course, I'm you know, having a, a close nervous breakdown at this point. And uh, we prayed and we would just see a miracle. And a miracle after miracle, and slowly the economy came back. And, and, uh, and during that time, by the way, the church was growing in number, even though the tithe was going down. <laughs> and uh, so it was just an interesting season. Then the next building project was right in the middle of 2008. We just were getting that done, and the biggest collapse I've seen in my lifetime was right after we got on that building project. So I, I just know that even when you start, you think it's a great time to start, typically two weeks into it or two months into it, it's like the worst tragedy ever. But um, I, I've, I've seen God do it. I, I've literally, it was literally the Lord shut everything down to, to watch him do it. And we were, and I'd love to tell you some more stories uh, of what the Lord did. But I'm just letting you know, when the Lord says it's time to go, it's time to go. And it will not be a good time. (laughs) It will just, you know, 90% of the people are saying, if we just wait a few more months, or let's just give it a couple more years, or let's save up a little bit more. Let's, it's always that case. Well, they borrowed this money. And then their kids were forced into a slavery. And, um, you know, the issue of money matters. Sometimes people try to separate their walk from God from their money. And it's like, it's amazing how closely those two things are aligned. When somebody has things right with their money, they also have a rightness before God. And they, they seem to tie together. And we see that throughout the Bible. Uh, in Matthew 6, Jesus says it as plain as day. In verse 19 to 24, Do not lay up for yourself treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where their treasure is, look at their heart will be also. Interesting. Now, he says something very radical in verse 22. The lamp of the body is the eye. If your eye is good, your whole body is full of light. If your eye is bad, your whole body is full of darkness. 
Therefore, the light that is in you is darkness. How great is that darkness explanation point? No one can serve two masters. He'll either hate the one and love the other, cling, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, a lot of times people say the eye is the window. Oh, it's, you know, how we, you know, look greedily or lustfully or, no, no. The eye is an expression in Jewish culture of giving. Why? why? I, I have no idea. I, I know often when I travel to other countries, people are, are, are saying, how can you drive somebody crazy? Like you're in a car and you're driving them and then they go crazy? And I'm like, no. And did they drive people crazy before cars? I'm like, I don't know. Maybe they rode their horses to craziness. I, I don't know. Well, I don't understand the expression. I have no idea. And, and here, this is the case. Why the I is somebody being giving or greedy? So you can see it in, in Deuteronomy 15, 9. He says, if the I is evil or bad or unclear, and he sees his poor brother and hardens his heart, and the Lord cries out. Proverbs 22, 9, the one who has a generous eye or a good eye or a clear eye will be blessed for he gives his bread to the poor. Proverbs 28, 22, a man with an evil eye, or unclear eye, bad eye, hastens after riches and does not consider that poverty will come upon him. And so um, if your body is, if your eye is good, in other words, you're giving in the way you're supposed to be giving, then your whole body is full of light. But if you're not giving the way you should, then your whole body is full of darkness. And then if that's the case, how great is that darkness? Interesting. And, and boy, this is consistent from Genesis to Revelation that you can see where this money thing, it's money is just so weird, isn't it? You know, if, if, if for some reason pebbles that we see on the ground were rare, then we'd all have pebbles. How many pebbles do you got? Oh, I got 300,000 of them in the bank. But, you know, we, we just decide. We look at this paper, piece of paper with one of our presidents on it, and it's some pretty unique paper, and we say that's worth this much. You know it's only because we agree on it, right? <laughs> the gold standard of a dollar was taken away by Nixon in the 70s. The only reason the American dollar is worth more than a, whatever, Canadian or, or, you know, a Yemen dollar is just because people think that. And, and, you know, for many years, diamonds were not given when you got engaged. That was simply a marketing by the De Beer family in the 1920s who basically worldwide said, you're really not engaged unless you got, give a diamond. And, and sure enough, we all feel that way. It's not very pretty. I mean, purple, green, yellow, there's a lot of prettier stones. Well, they're not a diamond, though. Yeah, it's just, it's just it's a clear piece of thing. You can, you can make plastic out of it look identical, and you can't tell the difference unless you put it under a scope. But yet, that's, we, we, it's, it's worth a lot of money because we agree it's worth a lot of money. It's really not worth a lot of money. If we tomorrow said diamonds... We, we found a whole bunch of them over here in a, in a valley, and there's enough for everybody in the world to have 100 of them. The diamonds wouldn't be worth anything anymore, would they? So the value of something or giving something or not giving something, it, it's, it's really only something if you decide it's something. Do you understand that? So... It really has to do with the heart. It really has to do with faith. And so when God says, give a tithe, and you're going 10%, maybe, maybe three and a half. Would you do, do three and a half? Two, two percent. Two, but no, five, five and a half percent. That's about as high as I can. Okay, okay, God, you know, 10% can't be done right now because I, I got a new car payment. But as soon as that car payment gets paid off, then I can bump it up to 8% possibly. Can we negotiate on this, God? 
And God's like, keep it all. (laughs) Don't give any of it. I don't need it. The earth is mine and everything in it. The gold, the silver is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills are mine. We, We get that, right? I mean, God isn't trying to get a tithe because he is poor and he is trying to be rich. Okay, you know that, right? I mean, heaven is paved with gold. Down here, it's, oh. And it's amazing how people will risk their lives to get gold out of a cave in a mountain. And then as soon as it gets to somewhere, they put it into a a rectangle block, and then they stick it down in the hole somewhere again. Right? Down in some bank in the basement of some bank in some vault all you did is unbury it over here stick it together in a rectangle and stick it right back in the ground where nobody can see it but that was smart somehow that was brilliant it's bizarre isn't it and so if you are to Say, God, I, I want to give the tithe to you rejoicingly, liberally. And then he says, it's not just the 10%. That, I'm doing that because I, I don't want anybody to say I burdened them. Oh, man, being a Christian's hard. You know, you know it's 80% of our money we have to give to God. We can only live on 20%. But God said, I don't, I don't want that. I, I'm going to come up with some ridiculous little amount that everybody who looks at this is going to go, that's ridiculous. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, God Almighty, it, to worship him with 10%, that's, that's it? I mean, it is. It's, it's an embarrassing amount. It really is. But then when people struggle over the 10%, that's embarrassing to you. And then he says an offering. It could be one penny. It could be a million dollars. Whatever's in your heart, give it generously. And the Bible's clear. You got to be doing it willingly, not of compulsion. You got to do it joyfully, hilariously. God doesn't want it. It literally sickens him. He, he honestly would much rather you have it because he is not taking it from you. You're giving it to him, if you will, that he might be able to add unto you re- heavenly reward. But he's also freed up. To, to, to say, because you're generously giving from your heart, I am just opening the windows of heaven and I just want to give you more. I want to bless you more. Isn't that what we want to do? If we see one of our kids sharing their candy or something special to them with another child, what does that do to us as a parent? Doesn't it want to make us bless our kids more? Right? So, again... It's an interesting thing that if the eye is clear, if you're tithing, giving offerings, letting the Holy Spirit lead you to help out people when he's showing you to help people or give to missions or give to other ministries or or getting yourself in a place where you can live on very little. I had a a neighbor in, in San Diego and him and his brother and his dad, they started a company and before they knew it, they were all multimillionaires. And uh, he was a really wonderful Christian man. And one day he was in the midst of building a bigger house than the one he already had. And, and, and God is like, how, how is this not, you know, building, tearing down old barns and building new barns so your soul can say, look what I've done. And, and just was just pierced to the heart. Bought an old house two doors down from where we lived house built in 1954 had like one watt of electricity to the whole house and um, 1200 square feet little tiny place sold his big house moved in there did not remodel it whatsoever bought two very reasonable cars and gave all the money every year to missions millions every year and just I mean he lived there for the last 20 years we were there and he never spent money on anything. He literally was storing up everything and but he didn't do it like vocally. It was it was just something that I happened to discover and know about him. 
But um, he was a very free guy, a very joyful guy. He did drink beer sometimes, so I don't know if he's going to go to heaven. <laughs> but uh, he was a Presbyterian. What do you expect? But, but I'll tell you what, it, it is humbling when you discover such testimonies. But in um, 1 Timothy 6, it makes it clear there, we're, real wealth is when we're content with what we have. And not to have a love of money, that's the root of every evil that is on planet earth. Matthew 6 and 4 says, store up treasure in heaven. It's a command. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 says that when we give, it must be generously, freely, cheerfully. 1 Corinthians 16 says we need to do it regularly, thoughtfully, proportionally, 10%, and privately, not to get glory from men when we give. David Guzik says this, money problems are rarely only money problems. We often think if we just had more money, our money problems would go away. It isn't true. And that's a proven fact. Just by looking at the lives of many of those who have won lotteries or come up with unexpected riches, if they had money problems before, they didn't know how to handle their money and glorify God with it, they wouldn't know how after. The same problems were, would soon show up again, often many times bigger than ever. Well, in Nehemiah 5, 6, he goes on to say, so when I heard this, I became very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. Exodus twenty two twenty five says plainly that if a person gets in a situation where they are in poverty, that the money lenders are, cannot charge interest. Plain as day. And, uh, and God threatens them as you go on into Exodus 22 saying, the Egyptians oppressed you. And when you were in your poverty and in your slavery, they made you poorer and enslaved you deeper with greater rigor. Don't ever you do that to your brother. We just studied on this, didn't we? In Ephesians 4, be angry, but do not sin. Don't let the sun go down in your wrath, nor give place or a foothold for the devil. So Nehemiah was not only right about being angry, he would have been wrong if he wasn't angry. He would have been sin. He would have been sinning if he wasn't angry at this injustice. Well, in verse 7 through 11, so after serious thought, I like the King James Version, it says, after I consulted with myself, <laughs> I rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said to them, each of you is exact, exacting usury or charging interest from his brother. So I called a great assembly against them. And I said to them, according to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold into other nations. This is a whole nother thing. You could never sell a fellow Jew to another nation, uh, to a Gentile nation. And they were doing this. This is just, this wasn't even brought up in the law because it was, it's beyond the thinkable. But they were doing it. Now, indeed, um, will you even sell your brethren? And should you, should they be sold to us? And they were silenced and found nothing to say. Then I said, what are you doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies? I also with my brethren and my servants am lending them money and grain. Please let us stop this usury. Restore now to them even this day their lands and their vineyards and their olive groves and their houses. Also a hundredth, which is 12% of the money and the grain and the new wine and the oil that you have charged them. So he's saying you stole that money. Because it was illegal, according to scripture, for you to charge it to them. So you actually owe them money back. I love David in David Guzik's notes. He said, Nehemiah was passionate enough to get angry, but he was wise enough to not act <laughs> in that anger until he had considered the matter carefully. He thought about it, cooled down, wasn't responding out of a momentary outburst of wrath. He really thought through it before he addressed it. But notice he didn't take it to the judicial system. Why? Because those were the very guys that were doing this. He just had to have a big group meeting and say, 
hey, the people that normally would judge in these matters are the people doing these matters. So I'm just bringing it before the whole crowd. And we see Nehemiah, he, he had to just, head, just go head first and just attack this problem. He was not a coward. He confronted these wealthy, influential um, spiritual leaders, judicial leaders. He had to confront them all. And he himself was sort of a stranger there. Jesus tells us in Matthew 18, we have that responsibility when we see a brother in sin or in a fault or in some translations, offending the brethren. It's not necessarily a sin, but what they're doing is offending the brethren. And when that happens, you go to them and to them alone. You don't bring it up, not even to your spouse. Just you, God brought it to your attention. Jesus says, if you have a, 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 a you see a splinter in your brother's eyes because you, know, you got to first get the log out of your own eye. A lot of times we can see the sin or the faults in other people because it's in us. And if he hears you, you've won your brother. If not, you take one other person, maybe two at the most other people. If that doesn't work, you eventually bring it to the whole congregation. And if he doesn't repent, then you kick him out as a sinner or it says tax collector, which it would not work in our culture because we love tax collectors, right, guys? Yes, yes, we think they're wonderful. The IRS is, is one of our favorite organizations. We love them. Just in case somebody hears this tape, right? Anyway, Paul had to do that with Peter. He had, when he got to Galatia, he realized that Peter was being a hypocrite and, and evidently he had talked to Peter and did the Matthew 18 thing and it didn't go anywhere. So Paul had to bring him in front of the congregation of Galatia and rebuke him for being a hypocrite and causing other Jews to be hypocrites by only being kosher when leading Jews from Jerusalem showed up and when they left, they were back to eating bacon and sausage. But um, we're all to do that. In Ephesians 4, it says we're speaking the truth in love, helping each other grow up. In other words, having to speak difficult truths to each other. But we do it in love. And even though it's still hard and still hurts and people still don't like it, it's our responsibility. In 2 Timothy 3, this is one of the main reasons we have Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And yes, it's good there for teaching, but notice three things for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, which is sort of the implication that they need to be told how to walk righteously because they're being rebuked and being corrected. And that's why we have this scripture. But he rebukes them and said, each of you guys are exacting usury. Again, Exodus twenty two twenty five, plain as day. If it's helping, if a poor person is asking for sustenance, they're asking for daily food. You do not charge them interest. You may not be in a situation where you can just give them money or you'll end up in poverty. But yet you, you say, I can't give it to you, but I'll lend it to you until you, you get in a better place and then you can give it back to me. But a rich person can say, I just give it to you. But in case you can't do that, you still can't charge them interest. I won't go in, into all detail, but in Leviticus 25, the whole, almost the whole chapter is on this point that you cannot charge interest in somebody's poverty. And boy, we need to check our heart towards the poor. Boy, there's so many Proverbs. I just put down a few of them here. But it says that we need to have mercy on the poor, that happy will that person. If, if God catches us oppressing the poor, we are rebuking our maker. We're offending God directly. But if we have mercy on the needy, God will honor us. Proverbs nineteen seventeen. if we have pity on the poor, God will lend. We're lending to God. We're going to get paid back the money we lend to the poor. Later, that money is going to come back to us in eternal rewards. And uh, Proverbs 22, 9, I read that earlier. The person with a generous eye will be blessed for he gives his bread to the poor. Now, the question quick, quickly comes up, well, what poor people? There's a lot of poor people especially in California here where they're, they're showing up from all over the place. 
Well, as you look in the scripture, there's a lot of money on helping people out. And it's very clear. It's only to the household of God. Our responsibility is not to help the non-believer poor. I'm not saying you can't. You can if you want. But you're only responsible to help the poor in our church body. 1 John 3 says that in verse 16 through 18, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. And if we also ought to lay down our lives for who? The brethren. But whoever has the world's good and sees who? His brother in need and shuts his heart from him. How does he uh, love God and abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word and tongue, but in deed and truth. And he goes on, and there's a lot of scriptures on this. It's clearly talking about those who are believers going through a difficult time of poverty. A lot of them went through a difficult time of poverty because of persecution or because they came a Christian. They were kicked out of their families or fired from their jobs or they lost their, their family and their job and, and their company. So the question often asked in, in this then is, well, what, what do you think about helping street people or the homeless that you see? And again, I, I say our obligation is only to the church family. A matter of fact, in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, it says, if you don't work, you don't eat. So he actually is rebuking the Thessalonians for helping out people who were not working and giving them money or giving them food. He's, he's saying, don't do that. That's wrong of you to do that um, because you're enabling them. And, and I'll tell you what, you're enabling people to be very unhealthy. You know, when I, when I worked in a downtown church, I, I, I saw it over and over again. When the prodigal had no food to eat, they went home. <laughs> and we helped them get a one-way ticket to wherever their family was at or call their family on the phone and reconcile with their family, uh, and then they would, they would get going back. The other question often comes up is, is um, when can we charge interest? And when it's not for necessity. So if somebody wants to buy a boat from you or buy a, a surfboard and they don't have the money and you, you loan them the money to buy the surfboard or you know, whatever, at, at, you can charge interest on that. It's only for necessity. Uh, and it's only to the poor who don't have money to eat. Well, it goes on to tell us that not only did they not give them money, they gave it to them at interest, and then when they couldn't make the interest payments, they put their kids into slavery. And again, this was permitted, but it wasn't out of God's will. You've got to understand that when the children of Israel left Egypt, if God told them what he really wanted the society to look like, most of the Jews just would have left because it would have just been bending the branch too far. It would have broke. So he gave them things out of concession. So yes, you can divorce, but here are the stipulations. Yes, you can have more than one wife, but here are the stipulations. Yes, you can own slaves, but here's the stipulations. And if you look at the stipulations... It just made it worth it not to do it. It's better to stay married than to divorce. It's better to not to be, not to, um, be a polygamist. It's, just, it's better not to own slaves. If you look at the way the system worked, it, it worked to the advantage or disadvantage of doing any one of those things. And again, I don't have time to go into all of them tonight. Um, but he, he said that if this happens, um, six years is the most they can be slaves. But he said... Very clearly, in Exodus 21 and also Leviticus 25, he said very clearly, they shall not be to you as a slave, but they will be to you as a sojourner or a servant who's living with you for a while. And often the conditions would get so good that the slave wouldn't want to leave. And the, and the owner couldn't say, well, yeah, yeah, it was a good six years, but you, you, I don't want you anymore. It wasn't on the owner's choice. If the slave said, hey, it's so good being your, you know, a visitor here. I'm just going to stay until the day I die. And the owner of the slave couldn't say no. It would go before the elders. He would get an owl in the ear uh, in a ceremony. He would be a bond slave. And forever that owner had to take care of that guy and his family. 
as well. And so often uh, people wouldn't want to be slave owners. They may, it may end up getting slaves for the rest of their lives and they don't want it, uh, but they don't have a choice in it. But either way, when the year of Jubilee came, every 50 years, everybody was out of debt. All, nobody was enslaved anymore. Everybody's land was restored back to them. And uh, it, uh, every 50 years, it, everything went back the way it was originally when Joshua brought them in to the promised land. But he, he's amazed at these people doing this, saying, don't you have any fear of God? Leviticus 25, 55 ends that passage on slavery by saying, for the children of Israel and their servants to me, they are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. He's saying, you are all my servants. And so if you end up making one of my servants one of your servants, think how I treat you. And that's how you better treat them. Or I will treat you the way you're treating them. That's scary. I, I would just like to make a note on this fear of God phrase. I really wish the term fear was not in the King James translation. It was perfectly fine in the 1600s, but the word fear in our modern English does not have the same connotation. Today, we would say honor, show respect, right? We wouldn't say hey, fear the police officer or fear the judge or fear the governor or fear, well, I guess in California that works across the board, doesn't it? Bad, 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 bad example. Uh, no, it just means to honor. So the beginning of wisdom is to honor God and, and respect him above all things. The beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge is just to have this over desire to see God honored in everything. And uh, so the idea of fearing God, First John says, no, 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 no. The fear, perfect love casts out a fear of God because that means judgment and God doesn't judge his kids in condemnation. But he says, now restore it back to them. And in verse 12 and 13, they said, we will restore it and we will require nothing from them, but we'll do as you say. And then I called the priests and required an oath from them. They would do according uh, to the promise and they shook out I shook out the fold of my garment. That's what they did in those days. They'd take their garment and shake it out. So may God shake out each man from his house and from his uh, property um, who does not perform his promise. Even thus may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly should amen and praise the Lord. Then the people did according to his promise. So there's a lot of reasons they would have stuff on their robe. You know, if they were whittling or they were eating or they were at work, you know, um, you, you'd shake out your robe to get all the dust off or get all the crumbs off or whatever it was. And, and it, it became a symbol of saying, God's going to shake you out and you're going to be dust on the ground or you're going to be like leftover food spoiling on the ground if you don't do this. But the people said, yeah, we will, we, we see it. We didn't see what it looked like until you pointed it out to us and we realized it was very wrong that we would take an advantage of people when they're serving all of us by building this wall. David Guzik says, the teachable, correctable spirit was impressive. Too few are willing to admit they are wrong and then do what is right, especially when money is involved. So each of them said that, but Nehemiah is wanting them to be accountable, not just to say the words, but to do the actions. And notice in verse 14 to 16, so moreover from that time, I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah from the 20th year until the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, 12 years. Neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provisions, but the former governor who were before me laid burdens on the people and took from them the bread and the wine, besides 40 shekels of silver, Yes, even their servants bore rule over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. Indeed, I also continued the work on this wall, and we did not buy any land. All my servants were gathered them for the work. So he uh, basically 
um, says that once I made them swear that they would do their thing, I then became an example. And before this happened, we saw it. We saw what a great time to invest is. Basically, nobody even wanted to live. We're going to see later in Nehemiah. Nobody even wanted to live in the city of Jerusalem. But the guys who were from Shusha and from other cultures, they knew it's like the land inside this city is going to be crazy expensive one day. And we can buy it at the rock bottom prices right now. And they had the money to do it. Most people didn't have any money to do it. So even if people saw, hey, this is a good time to buy uh, some property inside Jerusalem, um, they didn't have the money to do it. But these guys could have done it. But Nehemiah said, no, 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 no. Those people that needed money for food, we just gave it to them. And uh, the properties that were available that we could have made a killing on, we did not buy them. We did not take an advantage we did not make our self enriched off the people in any way, shape, or form. So he was a good example. Well, verse 17 and 18. And at my table were 150 Jews and rulers, besides those who came to us from the nations around us, coming to visit the governor. Now that which was prepared daily was one ox, six choice sheep, also fowl were prepared for me, once every ten days in an abundance of all kinds of wine. Yet in spite of this, I did not demand the governor's provision because the bondage was heavy on the people. So the normal city taxes that would have been given, he did not collect the taxes. He said, no taxes right now. Nobody's going to be taxed. And on top of that, almost every day was about 150 people he had to house and feed and take care of their needs. And he just, out of his own wealth, he just paid it and paid it and paid it and never told anybody about it. Well, verse 19, Remember me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. Now, some people have a a problem with this, going, hey, you know, what are you calling yourself good for? And, And why are you telling God to make sure he doesn't forget to reward you? But I, I love this. This is sort of Nehemiah's journal that we're getting ready, we're able to read. I don't know if Nehemiah knew we were going to be reading this. I don't think so. I don't think he wrote this to let everybody know, hey, just to let you know, I didn't boast about it, but, well, I, I am now, um, so forget that. No, he didn't do that. I don't think this was meant to be for public consumption, but it's for our consumption by the Holy Spirit to say, yes, when we are good and when we do good works, It's not not humble to say that. It can be prideful, it can be self-righteous, but it doesn't have to be. The Bible calls many men good men. The Bible points out many works that people did as good works. It points out how Cornelius had built the temple and how he tithed and how he spent a lot of time in prayer in Acts 10. So God says these guys were good people. They did good works. And I am going to reward them. Matter of fact, in Acts 10, talking about Cornelius, it says we've already built a memorial in heaven to this man and his faithful tithing and to his faithful praying. There's a statue in heaven to Cornelius, uh, to a man who gave much to the Jews as a Gentile. Well, Paul, in a similar way, he boasted Matter of fact, in 2 Corinthians 1.12, he says, Our boasting is this. (laughs) The testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly towards you. He goes on to say, Not one person was stumbled, but all of you guys were encouraged by observing our lifestyles. He says it again in Philippians 4, 9. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Sort of boasting. He's like, I'm living a good life. I'm living a godly example. And if you guys live the way I live, um, you'll see the peace of God, the shalom of God work in your lives. It was just a fact. 
And so Nehemiah, by him saying, Lord, I, I am losing out on earth, but I, I'm trusting uh, heavenly rewards uh, because I'm doing what's right in your eyes, even though it's hard <laughs> to do it. Um, watching all my wealth dissipate and uh, knowing what that's going to mean for my future, but I, I don't care because I, I know that you are observing this and I put it in your hands. Boy, we learn a lot about leadership in chapter five. We see a good leader is angry at evil and abuse. A good leader thinks before he acts, especially when he's emotional. A good leader has compassion for the oppressed. A good leader sees that things are done justly and fairly. A good leader has the courage to confront dominant, influential, rich people. A good leader needs to act before it affects everyone in the congregation. Be ready to deal with sin and confront the issues early on. 1 Corinthians says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. That's what happened in this situation. He should have caught it sooner. It would have been better. A good leader follows the scripture. A good leader must require action and not just words of promise. A good leader is looking for the approval of God and not man. Well, any thoughts on this subject tonight or any other subject um, or any questions you might have? We'll give it a couple of minutes here. And the wheels are turning. Any, any thoughts at all about anything? My shirt. What do you think of my shirt? <laughs> yes, Dave. Okay, great. Yeah. No, 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 it is. You know, there, there's, there, it's, it is, it's weird. You know, I, I, you know, we, the, the Calvary San Diego, the buildings I built there now are probably worth $40 million. I don't know. And at the same time, we're supporting four different orphanages spending 4000 a month, you know, 1000 each orphanage. And then you're, borrowing four million dollars <laughs> and building basketball courts and and stuff you know what i'm saying and i remember asking that one of the guys who was running the orphanage going help me help me with this it just i mean i could take all of those millions of dollars and build orphanages like all over the world and we could just be happy in a tent here and uh and it's like yeah it's weird isn't it because the fact is, is you build a bigger building, you have more people, you have more money to actually give. Um, but it, yeah, it's a trip. And especially like you, you know, like you said, you put your, being a good steward of your stuff and you're tucking it all away. And then you go on a missions trip to a very poor area. Then, then it's like, whoa, it's weird. We had several of our missionaries, my kid, one of my sons, Nathan, in, in particular, who lived in Eastern Europe for a time. And I, a few kids did this. They came back and just, gave everything they had away and had like one pair of pants and a shirt and their guitar and they had, their room was empty. And uh, he's never stopped living like that. It's today, he he's, has a couple pair of pants and a shirt and just lives a very minimal life because he believes that's a better way to live. And because everybody had to live that way in Eastern Europe. And, he, and even though he lived in the Western culture and he could have you know, hundreds of shirts and pants. He doesn't feel it's right in the eyes of God. So it's interesting. It's trippy. Money's trippy, you know. Can you elaborate more on the 
Yeah, the, it's just the eye, it's, you have a good eye in the Jewish culture, uh, the Bible times that they're written. I don't know if it's in modern Judaism today, but that's just meant, oh, you have a good eye or you have a clear eye. You're a giving, that just means you're a giving person. Yeah. Like if I were to say to you, you're a good egg. You're a good egg. It's like, I'm an egg? Yeah, it just means you're a good person. Yeah. You're all good eggs. Well, let's uh, have Matthias come on up and let's uh, spend a couple minutes here in prayer and we'll, we'll finish off. We'll end here in five minutes or so. Um, but let's just jump right into it in the prayer time and just thank the Lord for our church. Thank the Lord for what he's doing here, what he's building in our fellowship and, and um, whatever else is on your heart.